them, she eats them. He thinks he's gonna wake up a, a widower the next morning. <laughs> but lo and behold, she knew what she was doing. And this got him very interested in mushrooms. So in his spare time, Wasson developed a lifelong obsession with mushrooms, especially the psychedelic ones. He studied how they influenced human cultures around the world and came up with a theory that the origin of religion was actually rooted in people's transcendent experiences on magic mushrooms. And if you think about it, where do these interesting, bizarre ideas at the heart of many religions come from? That there is a beyond, that there's an unseen world, that there's a realm of the dead that you could visit, that there is a heaven and a hell. I mean, these are interesting ideas, and you could see why having a psychedelic journey would convince you of their truth. He looked into the use of uh, Amanita muscaria in Siberia, I think it is, and the Eleusian mysteries of the ancient Greeks, where they all got together once a year and they had a rite around Demeter, worship of Demeter, and everybody partook of this potion called the Kikion, which has also never been really identified, gave people access to an unseen world and they went and visited their ancestors. And he believed that too might have been a derivative of the ergot fungus. That is the fungus from which LSD is derived. But then the last case, and the most relevant, he heard about these mushroom cults in Central America, and he went looking in Mexico for years, didn't he? Multiple trips down there. I think he had like 11 trips down there. Looking for he... someone who would take him in so he could participate in a mushroom ceremony. Yeah, and given had the secrecy that surrounded it, earning someone's trust so they would actually say, yes, we do use mushrooms this way, and Yes, I will administer some to you. But he finds a woman, a curandera or a healer named Maria Sabina in the town of Huatla de Jimenez, which is a couple days by mule outside of Oaxaca in the very remote mountains. And she gives him the mushrooms, what she calls the little children. And he has this experience in the basement of this, this house. And he brings a photographer and he recounts this experience in the pages of Life magazine in a like 17 page article. <laughs> the reason he gets it into Life magazine is that he's friendly with Henry Luce, the publisher. And Henry Luce, as it turns out, is a giant fan of psychedelics. He's had psychedelic <laughs> therapy. I know, it's the weirdest history. Oh yeah, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. But you have to remember, all this is legal, right? This is 1955, he has his experience in 56 or 57, he publishes the article. And this article really introduces much of the West to psychedelic mushrooms and psychedelic experience in general. So Gordon Wasson is really a pivotal figure in this history. By the 60s, psychedelics had become part of the counterculture. Not only was there plenty of experimentation, scientists launched a series of innovative research projects on possible therapeutic uses. So I went to Mexico. Timothy Leary. He's mushrooms. Oh, sacred mushrooms. Read Gordon Wasson's story in Life magazine, and once he became a Harvard professor, he ran various studies of both psilocybin and LSD. Come along if you can. Often involving his own students. Come along if you can which got him kicked out of Harvard. Right and by the late 60s, the psychedelic revolution had imploded and the FDA shut down all the research. Now, this wasn't exactly like the Spanish crackdown on mushroom cults, but once again... The sacred mushroom went underground. And it might have stayed that way if not for a few mushroom obsessives who kept stoking the flame. It is still absolutely mysterious, appalling, challenging, boundary dissolving, and unavoidably ecstatic. It is the living mystery. Terence McKenna, an ethnobotanist and legendary psychonaut, had traveled all over the world, studying and experimenting with a whole range of hallucinogens. Even after they were banned, McKenna was one of the few people who still talked openly about mushrooms. And he came up with a wild idea that eating magic mushrooms led directly to the origins of human consciousness. Essentially, the mushroom made us human. This is known as the stoned ape theory. If we're looking for a missing link, 
It isn't a transitional skeleton. It isn't meddling by extraterrestrials. It has to do with the fact that we began to allow into our diet an exotic pseudo-neurotransmitter. And I believe that mushroom was the triggering factor that moved us from being an advanced hominid, an advanced animal, to being, in fact, a conscious, self-reflecting, caring, thinking, dreaming, striving human being. find it completely implausible. <laughs> okay, this is really far out. The idea that magic mushrooms rewired the brains of our ancient ancestors and created human consciousness. But the funny thing is people can't stop talking about it. Now, Terrence McKenna died nearly 20 years ago, but his younger brother Dennis who traveled with Terrence on some of their wild psychedelic adventures in South America and wrote two books with him. He has his own take on the stone date theory. Actually, I came up with the idea. <laughs> really want to know. I came up with the idea, but he popularized it. His idea was psilocybin mushrooms enhance visual acuity. They were useful for hunting. You take mushrooms and you could spot the game. Yes, they do do that. This is where his theory and my theory differ. I say one of the things that can happen often with psychedelics and especially with mushrooms is so-called synesthesia where you get crosstalk between sensory modalities so you can see sounds. What I've said for a long time is that this is the key to language because language is synesthesia. It's a learned skill that mushrooms taught us. I can say a word, table. Chances are you visualize a table in your head, right? right? Mushrooms provided that key link between a meaningless sound, a potentially meaningless image, and a meaningful interpretation. So mushrooms were the key to how we learn to create symbols. I have to back up for a moment yeah. just to see if I understand what you're saying. So you're saying that this ancient consumption of mushrooms, magic mushrooms, tens of thousands of years ago, triggered something in the brains of our human ancestors that helped us be able to talk? That helped us be able to talk, yes, and actually helped us be able to develop a language. But it's not simply that we ate mushrooms and became smart. We do know from the fossil record that there was an enormous, almost explosive expansion of the hominid brain over about two million years. It increased three times in size. Two million years is not very long in evolutionary terms. Something made this happen. These people evolved in complex environments and with a lot of challenges. I think the mushrooms gave them the ability to visualize abstractions, essentially, to create models in their heads that gave them imagination. So today, once again, psychedelics are back. Not legally, at least yet. But in labs around the world, scientists are rediscovering their therapeutic uses. We are in a new golden age of psychedelic research, and Robin Carhart Harris is one of the leading experts. In his lab at London's Imperial College, he's been putting people on psilocybin into brain scanners in his groundbreaking studies of treatments for depression and anxiety. So what does he think of the stoned ape theory? It's a fascinating idea, really exciting, kind of, you know, spine chilling. Yet, um, I'm not sold. <laughs> I just think that it's a bit too psychedelic centric. And it's not clear that every human culture took psilocybe mushrooms. So it could be we're asking the wrong question. Maybe this isn't really a matter of trying to prove that magic mushrooms jump-started the human brain long ago. 
Carhart Harris is more interested in figuring out why psychedelics have such powerful effects on the mind and what that might tell us about the nature of human consciousness. He says these substances can open up new neural pathways and they actually give our brains access to more information. In fact, he calls psychedelics mind revealing rather than mind altering. People have insights, emotional insights, personal insights, remember things sometimes very remote into their childhood. Is this tapping into our unconscious? Well, that's the, that's the implication, yes. It suggests something pretty powerful, which is that we don't normally, in our everyday waking state, really don't have access to maybe what's most important in our minds. Maybe we need some help getting there. Yes, and then it raises curious questions like, why has the mind and the brain evolved that way? And the world is bigger, is what you're saying, on psychedelics, more expansive? Yeah, I suppose because so much of the world is actually inner, and it's so vast. That's the huge revelation, I think, that psychedelics bring, is just the symbolism and the iconography that you'll see in art, for example, or that's depicted in horror films, or... Uh, in religions, it's it's all there, you know, in a very vivid and elaborate way that one can experience under a psychedelic. There's no question a psychedelic experience can blow your mind. It can also be terrifying. And the thing about psychedelics that's different from any other drug, every person's experience is unique and unpredictable and for most people, unforgettable. Remember Michael Pollan from earlier? He says his psychedelic experiences fundamentally changed him. The brain is more mysterious, or my brain is more mysterious than I understood, and my mind is. But I also was changed in my understanding of what it means to have a spiritual experience. Something I don't think I'd ever had. Something I was kind of allergic to. I tended to think that to be spiritual was to believe in the supernatural, and I very much didn't. I'm, I'm really a pretty staunch materialist in my outlook on things. But I found that what happened when my ego dissolved in that psilocybin experience, the walls come down and you merge with whatever is around you. And it made me understand that, you know, the real definition of spiritual is not something supernatural, it's connection. Spiritual experience is deep, powerful, undefended connection between the self and what is normally another, an object whether it's another person, music, the universe, nature, the walls come down and you have this powerful sense of connection, which many people call love. To the best of our knowledge, is produced at Wisconsin Public Radio. Our executive producer, Steve Paulson, brought us today's Mushroom episode. Joe Hartke is our sound designer and technical director, and they had help from Mark Rickers, Angelo Bautista, Shannon Henry Cliver, and Charles Monroe Kane.